Lagos 2020 for those of you yet to join us. My name is Tayo Ogumbi and I'm head of curatorial at Artex Collective. I would like to introduce Wana Udobang, moderator of this conversation. Wana is a storyteller and artist working at the intersection of writing, poetry, performance, and film. Her poetry interrogates memory, healing, and reimagination. Wana, over to you. Um, thank you so much, Dame Tayo, uh, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Welcome again to um, Artex Lagos 2020. Um, I'm very excited to be moderating this conversation, this wonderful conversation called um, "What We Saw in October." And this conversation is basically connecting to an ongoing um, online exhibition right now called "The New Nigeria Studios," which features about 58 um, different artists from about 17 states in Nigeria. Um, capturing the protests that happened in October. Um, the project seeks to amplify the voices of, of those who documented this powerful movement um, as it was unfolding and just kind of thinking about the movement and, and how it's going to expand and how it's going to move further as well. Um, considering social media in that too. Of course, we're in a pandemic, so a lot of things are online. So the exhibition is going on right now at artxlagos.com. Um, so of course, um, we have two wonderful photographers who will be an artist who will be joining us in this conversation today. What I'm going to do is where I'm going to I'm just going to ask the questions, but I also kind of want um, our panelists to interact with each other and also react to each other as well. So it's a very flowing, flowing conversation. Um, so if there's something that some um, you know Yagazia says and Kilechi want to react to that, please please feel free to throw it and, and likewise the other way around as well. Um, of course, you know that the, the conversation is about what happened in October and that's the NSARS movement and how you know the extrajudicial judicial killings of Nigerian citizens led to this protest and of course culminated in what we now describe as the Leki massacre that happened on the 20th of October as well. Um, I'll, at this point, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, first, we have Kilechi Amadiobi, who is an artist um, and an internationally recognized photographer as, as well for his, both his photography and his paintings. Um, he's exhibited everywhere. <laughs> I don't need to mention too many. And um, Kilechi, of course, has worked with some of the biggest uh, multinational companies in Nigeria and abroad, um, from MTN to PZ Cousins to British American Tobacco and Ford Foundation and so many more. So Kilechi Amadiobi. Nice to be here. Yes. We have to do nice our class. You know, nice it's it's virtual here. now. Um, <laughs> nice to be here. Thank we you. We also have uh, our second panelist, of course, is the incredible Yagazi Emezi, who is a Nigerian artist and photojournalist whose um, stories focus around um, African women, their health, sexuality, education, and human rights. Yagazi also covers stories um, on identity, culture, social justice, 
um, climate change and migration. Her art practice uses photography and sculpture to construct visual and um, visual critiques of Nigeria's socio-political state and the roles media plays um, in it and um, pulling from history and current events as well. Um, Yagazie has worked with Al Jazeera, the New York Times, Vogue, Time Magazine, National Geographic, and numerous nonprofits. And she's just an in incredible creative as well, who I admire a lot too. So big shout out. Thank you for being here. Yay. So I think, um, I guess we're just going to go straight into it, which is, I know you were both at the protest. And I think I want to start with the feeling uh, because you, um, Yegas, especially you were covering, you know, daily. So I want to know from both both perspectives the feeling of what it was to be in that space. So like, Yegas, yeah, I'll let you go first. Thank you, Lydia. Yeah. Okay, I think, um, and I've been, I've told this over and over again. So I feel as if I'm already a broken record at this point. But I would say when I attended my the first protest that I attended, which was um, Lekki One into Ikoi. It was really from that viewpoint of, you know, I want to be there to document our times and be an observer, you know, but it was so hard not to participate. Even though I was holding, I, I was running around, so I couldn't actually catch my breath to join in chants. Yeah. But in my head, I was like, you know, chanting along with people. By the next protest I went to, I was full on like yelling at the top of my lungs because, you know, with, with this is not something that you can just be a witness to. You know, this is our communities. These are our friends, these are our, our neighbors. And even though a lot of us were strangers, the feeling that I instantly got was not that. I have, you know, I've worked in different environments across Nigeria, but I would say that this was the one few times where I actually felt like I belonged, regardless of not knowing people. Everybody was checking in on people. People with strangers would tap me and say, do you need water? Do you need food? Are you okay? Everybody was in tune with one another, yeah. you know, even as strangers. And that was, that was the first sense that you get at these, um, at these gatherings and protests is, is that oneness, you know, despite all of us coming from very different backgrounds, it was this very strong sense of being together. Yeah, um, I definitely want to come back to unpack a lot of what you said, but let me go to Kelechi quickly to just tell me his own, Kelechi, what was, what was your own sort of feeling when you were in that space? Well, the first thing I noticed was the energy. You know, there was an energy. Um, there was this thing that is different. It was different from other protests. By the way, I mean, um, when I was in university, we used to do, you know, go on all sorts of riots, the Babangida riot, the SAP riots, and things like that. But there was something different about this one. I went to the Lekki uh, toll gate, mm. and I started to see the emergence of a, a thing. You know, now one of my major issues, I always say, is that Nigeria is a country, but it's not yet a nation. Mm. Being a country, it has geographical and okay, we're all Nigerians, but nationhood is a, is, a, is a condition of mind. It is what somebody says being holding a particular passport, what it means to them, you know? But at that protest, I started to see an emergence of a unifying, you know, sort of an attempt to define who we are and what we stand for. A play, the, 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 so people were being indoctrinated on what it means to be Nigerian. People were waving Nigerian flag and trying to find the meaning to it, you know? So it was, it was that energy that I saw. And it then cut across the usual things that divide us, ethnic, class, you know, gender, you know, it's, it's sort of cut across all those things. Mm -hmm. And there was this energy that was imagined that is starting to define us, to say, oh, you know, I want a Nigeria where a nobody can, the son of a nobody can become somebody without knowing anybody. You know, I mean, these are quotes that they were screaming at each other. And, um, and then I started to notice these other things, people, 
going about picking up trash. That really got me off guard. I'm like, okay, now this is new. Usually when people go for protests, they just trash out the whole place and it's just nasty. They started to see them sharing food to the hungry and giving water and everybody trying to see what they could do. So um, I noticed that energy and it was really, really that light at the end of a tunnel that will tell young people that it is not all hopeless. You know, that's what I saw. And I was really, really um, excited about it. Uh, it was different. It was well organized. It wasn't easy, you know. I mean, there's so many different types of people coming together to say one thing, you know, we have the right to be alive. We have the right, you know, to live, not to be killed. Um, I mean, thank you so much for that observation. It's very interesting because um, what you say for me, I'm, all, I'm also seeing the fact that this protest be went beyond, I mean, we all knew that this, this protest went beyond the ens NSAS as a total oh, yes. scene. Um, but that the things you mentioned felt like it was the beginning of young people re-envisioning and reimagining in Nigeria that they wanted now. That um, is it. That is and, it. And that brings me to Yagazi actually, because you did many, you said this thing about, you know, you went in there, you know, typical you know, typical journalists were like, okay, we're gonna process is happening in my back door. Let's do this. This is this is what we do. And then you go in and then you realize these are these are my people. And you know, this is this is me. I'm part of this. And I, I remember somebody somebody tweeting about, and you responded to that tweet actually about, oh, when you go into a protest, you need to distance yourself and cover it as though as a journalist, not. A, and you responded to it that you're a human being. But I want I want you to kind of speak to what that brought that attachment brought to the work for you. I think the. Um... And this is this is a a practice and, or a state of being that I carry throughout, you know, my work, which is I'm a human being first, and then I'm a photographer, you know. And there is a fine balance when it comes to photojournalism, where you know you should document what's happening, and despite the fact that I know which side I stand on, it doesn't mean that I'm going to censor something that stands against that my side. You know, it is my duty to document both fairly and not hide anything, but I'm not going to, you know, try and, because I'm like, oh, for one side, I'm only going to focus on one, on that area. Um, and I think it really helped because, you know, after, you know, after Kofi was um, put in place and whatnot, I had this moment of, my first moment of actual frustration because it takes a while for me to actually feel things sometimes. Um, but I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I remember that, you know, I got bombarded with emails from all these publications and um, platforms saying, you know, would love to like feature your work, and, like all this other stuff. And, you know, a lot of what those emails said is that, oh, we've been seeing your protests. Um, your pictures of the protests. And I was so frustrated because my first question to myself was, why are they just reaching out now? You know, why did they have to wait for people to die? I mean, we know why, we know why how media works, but yeah. it's still that frustrating question of, you know, why did they have to wait for people to die? And then the second part was, did I not do enough? You know, did, shouldn't I have maybe reached out to editors when I started documenting to say, oh, well, you know, start pitching a story, mm -hmm. you know, but mm -hmm. to be honest, that's not how I work at all, because my belief is you do the actual work first. And I believe that it would have been quite different if I was being sent out there on assignment, being commissioned to create the work versus going there because I have had friends who I consider family, who are affected by this, one way or the other, direct, indirectly most of the time. But you know, you feel the pain of your friends, you know, of your community, and that is your community. So I think that's how um, it would have been very different if I had gone there working for a publication. Yeah. Um, because yeah. I'm still trying to, to be quite honest, I'm still trying to work out of that mindset of, okay, if I'm working for XYZ newspaper, this is how I know they like their images, you know, and th that little thing will filter into my psyche of how I work. And 
been at these protests, none of that was there. You know, when I was tired, I was tired. I would sit down. If I wanted to eat, I would eat. Versus if I was working for someone, I'll be like, no, I'm on a job. You know, I have to do this. And I think that, you know, that allowed for a little bit, and I don't know whether it's the right phrase, but it allowed for a little bit more of softness despite certain settings being hard, you know, yeah. because we're out in the sun, people are yelling, people are chanting, but it allowed for a little bit of softness within myself and also how I approach people, you know, maybe not so desperate because <laughs> I, I need to get someone's quotes or something like that, but just genuine curiosity and ultimately being there for for, shall I say, largely trying to get some sort of representation of the story, but also being there for myself. Mm -hmm. And I think the work you do for yourself will always speak louder than when you're getting paid to do it. I mean, I think that's something, I, I love what you say about this softness, because I think what happened um, from what I'm hearing is that it, the, the process allowed you to bring in all of yourselves into documenting and taking those images. So you're not thinking about the publication and yeah. the on one side of your head, but you are just, you know that, you know that these images will go out, but you also know that these are, these are your people and these are, you know, and you are, you have the responsibility of carrying their voices and being tender and all of those things with them as well. Um, and I think that definitely yeah. showed in the images that you, you took. And I, I feel like there was a sense of control that you had in what you took and how you shared them as well as a result of that. I think that was really a, a strong part is, you know, also the responsibility of not sharing everything, mm -hmm. you know, not handing over, you know, and I, and I said no to a lot of these publications that were like, oh, you know, we'll pay you money for these images because for me, it's in a way, it's, it's this balance that I struggle with where it also still doesn't feel like mine to give or mine to share certain images. And maybe they will never be seen, or maybe there'll be a time in which they will be more visible, but it's also to have that level of self-control where it's like, even if you think you have a great image, it doesn't necessarily need to be put up on Instagram because the job, most of the job was to be present. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Kelechi, something, you know, you are, you've, you've witnessed different generations of protests. You talked about Shagari, yeah. to school, to student union, to Occupy Nigeria. Yeah. And I think um, something that's interesting for, about you is that you were part of a generation of, of witnessing protests where there, were, there was leadership within those protests. Yeah. Um, so whether that is student, student union, union leadership or Labor Congress le leadership um, or celebrity yeah. front-facing front leadership. And then yeah. this time around, it's a democratized movement. And we're saying there is an insistence on no face and no leadership. And then I know that you also, you also photographed celebrities when you were there. And you got some flack on the internet. I don't know if you saw this. Yes. <laughs> but you did. Um, yes, yes. You know, and I, I'm interested in, in knowing your take on on the flack you got, whether it yeah. was something, you know, and your feelings towards it, even now after sort of marinating on it and seeing how yeah. the protests progress. It was interesting. You know, the truth is that each time you pick up your camera and you point it, your, your, the picture you're making, um, though you say, oh, you want to tell the story, but you're bringing out a bit of yourself. Um, so all the time, each photograph you make is a kind of self-portrait. Say something about how you feel. You understand? The first day I went to the um, to the to the uh, protests at Lakey, oh, all my celebrity friends were like, "Ah, Kalechi, let me pose for you." You know. So before I knew it, I was taking all these portraits of all these people. Wow, you so know, it wasn't intentional, it wasn't planned. No, in oh. fact, you know, when I come to a place, I come with my mind open. I'm just coming to observe, you know. Uh, when I went there, like Yagazir said, you know, it was, my mind was tabla rasa. It's like, let me go and see what is happening. Let me go and support what is happening. Let me go and observe so that I won't be told that this is what happened. I need to see it for myself. 
So immediately I got down. That was what happened. You know, I saw all these people and they all gravitated towards me. And oh, you, you can't say no. You know, no, I don't want to photograph you. Go away. You know, so I took all these um, celebrities. And then, yes, and then I put some of that on uh, social media and people started screaming, my goodness, how dare you put up their pictures, you know? And I said, you know, I'm looking at this. No one picture can define the entire struggle. Still photograph is going to get you one point of view. Then I thought to myself, but this everybody that is at that place is sort of risking their lives. You never know when the soldiers are going to come with their life bullets. You don't know the day, you don't know the time. You understand? You know? So I was asking Wait, myself- I, Sorry, Kalishi. Yeah. Can I add something in there? Um, Go ahead. Do you think that the, the backlash was due to the fact that it was predominantly celebrities? And then that's my first question. And yes. then this, because also when it comes to celebrity, there's also this act of performance, yes. especially in places, in roles of activism, you know, there yes, is yes, yes. performative of course. Mm -hmm. And then the second one question is that maybe one that you can link into it after is, you know, was there, re I mean, there was a risk, but was there really a win risk? Because I think that was, you know, that came with the shock also of the Lekki massacre is yes. I do believe that part of the shock of the Lekki massacre was that we would never have expected it to take place at Lekki Togate of all places at that scale, you know? So I would disagree with that statement in thinking that a lot of people at that particular Lekki Toll site were coming there fully aware of the fact that they were risk it was a risk no, versus it was also this performative role that some people just wanted to carry out as in all oh, yeah. events around you. Yeah, world. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, how do I put it? You know, once you show up at any protest, unless you are really naive, you see, that protest was a challenge of authority. And once you're there, you are taking a risk. Maybe they didn't know it, but I was aware of it. Mm. I mean, I've seen how Nigerians, the Nigerian state has dealt with different protests. It's the same playbook, if you get what I mean, you know? And any of those people could have stayed back in their homes to be seen there, to be actively questioning the government. A lot of those so-called celebrities, they do get their patronage from government. I remember during Good Luck, a, a huge amount of patronage was coming from government, the state. Yeah. you know, um, for actors, actresses, musicians, you know. So if, if you come out, forget that, of course, there are so many other motives, like you said, you know, people want to go and perform and get some nice pictures, yeah? But at the bottom of it, there's also something that they were bringing to that protest. And I also ask myself, should it be ignored just because, well, how did they get famous? By doing whatever they're doing well. You understand, you know, they were not the only people I photographed. I photographed a couple of other people who I didn't know. Um, I got curious about them and then I was photographing. Um, but that was the first day. Mm. On the second day, I calmed down and I said, okay, Kelechi, settle down, don't get distracted by all these people and just observe. That was when I started looking at all these things going on. That's when I started to listen to all the things they were saying. That was that I started to see different classes of people and the way they were reacting, you know, to that Lake Ito gate and how people were beginning to fuse in terms of their consciousness. Then I started reading what the people were writing and started looking at them and trying to understand what their pain was and how that relates to the struggle. You know, like I said, you cannot represent the entire thing with one picture. It's a series of pictures. But did, did, uh, like you, did you agree with any of the of the backlash in any way at some point, or did you? But it's you, wonderful. Did you, did you change towards it. It's it's wonderful. You know, the truth is that uh, it's also important to understand how people see things. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the worst things you can do is to to close up and say, "Oh, you know, I know the I know best." You know, when people. There are people who 
uh, were respectfully disagreeing with me and I engaged them and I asked them a couple of questions and went back and forth. You understand? There were people who were very, very rude. They were not important, you know, to me, you know. Um, but I listened to these people. I tried to reason with their idea and the way they see what was happening. And uh, it made a lot of sense in a lot of ways. And you know the funny thing? Every picture you take is going to be viewed from a, so many different angles. I don't know if you get what I mean. Yeah. Everybody is biased based on their personal experiences. Mm -hmm. If you get what I mean. So no picture is going to be accepted happily by everybody. You know, and if there is no controversy about it and there are no questions, I don't even know if that picture is really hitting home, you know. Um, but for me, it was interesting, you know, to listen to those criticisms and also appreciate. You see, I'm a, I'm a fashion photographer. I shoot a lot of advertising and I shoot portraits. You know, my work is fantasy all the time. You know, I started from painting. And what do I do? I sit down and I want to create something that is inside my head and I bring it to pass. You know, it's different from like reportage where you go and you observe, you understand, and you try to understand. But I've also said this, each time you go into a space, try and be yourself. Don't be others. I don't know if you understand. I came there, I wasn't on assignment. You know, like she was saying, if you're on assignment, you would be making illustrations, really. And you'll be thinking about the text that will go with your illustration, you know? Um, and you're thinking about what this person wants. When I went there, my motive was, Kelechi, go and see what is happening and try and record it. You understand? And when I look at the body of work, it's interesting. It's quite diverse, you know? Um, and... Uh, what can I say? You know, if you do not record it, then it didn't happen. You know, yeah. at the point I started looking at the photographers that were shooting, I started observing the way they were concentrating and the way they were, and the, the energy that we were bringing, you know, so there are different facets of this, um, you know, of the struggle. I mean, you can, you can tell the story from so many different angles, but I also told myself, it doesn't mean we need to ignore completely the celebrities that came. They too are human beings. All right. Um, yeah, Gaziel, let's talk about um, photography and activism because, um, you know, you did mention this struggle and I'm a journalist as well. And, and it's a question I get a lot, you know, when, when, when am I reporting and when is it activism or, you know, how do I separate myself? Um, I'm interested in photo um, photography and act activism specifically actually because sometimes there can be an extractive nature to to report to um, you know reporting reporting work a lot of the time um, and this idea we, which we kind of previously spoke about where people you find yourself in a position where you are thinking of a human being as a story sometimes before the human being and so I, I want to kind of ask you about but at the same time I also know that with a lot of your work there is also there is always an activism activism element in terms of you creating work about an issue that is important to you or that you believe in as well, and also bringing this protest back into view. I want to kind of know about your take and your view on how you how you work and how you combine your activism with your photography. Um, a lot of the issues I cover. Uh topics that I care about and I believe the world should care about. Um, but I think it's quite different because a lot of the work that you've probably seen have been a lot of stuff that I have done on assignment, you know, that have been commissioned. And it's just a matter of me saying, you know, an editor reaching out to me and I'm saying, oh, well, that sounds good. I like, let's go for it, you know, because our issues are endless. Um, I'm not too sure how to answer your question, to be frank, because a lot of the work that um, I know that you're referring to is, is me just amplifying these stories. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I'm not picking, in a way, I'm not picking and choosing and saying, okay, this is something that I am going to focus on for, you know, you have people who will focus on women's health for yeah. most of their career and X, Y, and Z, but my problem is that 
everything is important and I do believe in the value of every individual story. Mm. So maybe I can't say for myself, maybe that is a form of activism where it is me focusing on all these other issues that other people are focusing on. Mm. Bear in mind, these are the people who are in the front lines actually doing the work, actually carrying the majority of the labor. It's not me. <laughs> you know, just to be quite honest. And that is my role or the small contribution I can make with yeah. photography is documenting that. So I don't personally, I do not consider myself an activist. Okay. We can lightly say that I consider myself maybe a recorder of actors or documentarian of that. But I think that the amount of work um, and effort that goes into finding solutions to a lot of these issues, I can, I can put no claim to because it is not me doing the work. It is not me every day going out on the front lines and fighting for people, you know? And I, I just have to be honest with that. Yeah, and I, I know I understand what you mean. I, I often feel the same way as well. Even when I'm told I'm an activist, because I'm like, there are people doing work who, who commit their lives to sustainable change. Um, and I often feel like sometimes I just come and do what I can and move away again, you know. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't carry the we don't carry the PTSD with us all the time like some people do, you know. I mean, sometimes we do tend to pick it up because yeah. at the end of the day, we're still going to all these different places and gathering and hearing and you know, if you're an empath, you're feeling a lot of this, you know. You're seeing people who are you're hearing stories of people who are in pain. You're yeah. seeing struggle, you know? Yeah, I mean, on the bright side, you're also seeing triumphs and all this other stuff, but all these negative stories that we hear, some parts of us still carry it with us. Okay. Um, but, you know, we just, our line of work sometimes with us, I would say, uh, is not necessarily just focusing on one issue and working on it for the long term. Sometimes we can focus on one story for one year and then we move on to something else. You know, um, but so yeah, it's a it's a heavy it's a very heavy thing to try and even attempt to carry your claim and say that you know we're doing that not to discredit the work that we do do, but do do. <laughs> but at the end of the day, is you know I, you get it. It's still. But it's you know, even, even saying that, I also I also want to now bring it back to you know October and NSAs and and the photographers covering the movement because. Something that I also saw that was happening was people were having, you know, some kind of PTSD and fatigue. A lot of the photographers who were covering it, and there was for the first time a lot of um, collective efforts into care yep, for yep. photographers. People were organizing re little mini retreats or online support groups for photographers because you know they were seeing things on a daily basis. Um, you know. Some people are, you know, we talk about the energy uh, um, about the protest, but there were all, there was also areas where there were things that were happening like surreal, other things that were happening like surreal area, and people were seeing yeah. crazy things happen. Very dangerous. You know? Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I put up people were seeing people that were water cannon down and um, you know tear gassed as well, and it was very emotionally exhausting for a lot of people as well. So, um, I think that I'm I'm wondering, you know, if you have anything to say about because as much as we you you just said this you don't see yourself as an activist and all of this sort of stuff but there is also a heavy weight even when we move in and out of this world of trauma documenting it there is also a weight that we carry with us as well yeah um, i think that's a weight that is you know shared with a lot of people you know i think people tend to group photographers into this one thing without realizing they're in the same environment as you know the activists or whatnot so it's very comparable to let's say conflict photographers yeah. when you're with let's say a unit at war you're experiencing the same thing you will get ptsd you know you will like feel the trauma of gunshots and bombs and seeing documented injuries and all this other stuff why because you are human first you know, so even though you're out, like, you know, with some of the photographers who are present when there was actually shooting going, going on, they're going to carry that same trauma as much as the people who are running away from the bullets, exactly. if not more so, because we will also have that instinct to want to actually stay behind and witness it some more, you yeah. know, so it's, there is pain in this work you know, across the board, but 
there is pain. <laughs> you know, I don't want to keep on minimizing it, but because I see so much of what other people in India, it's like there's also trauma in, in being a nurse. You think that it's the main thing that the doctor will endure because he's the one cutting it open, cutting up a body, but a nurse carries just as much weight. You know, there isn't any hierarchy to pain. Unfortunately, you know, pain is pain at the end of the day. Um, so for me, it's I'm very big on self-care because there were some days where I felt completely exhausted. Um, I have arthritis, I have knee issues. So for me, it was like some days I started limping and I knew that I needed to like take about two days off. But yeah. then when I'm sitting at home for two days, I start feeling guilty that <laughs> I'm not on ground with my yeah. peers and with my friends and people that I support and care about at large, you know? Um, so it's also being able to, to recognize the, and in a way, I guess, also appreciate the labor in the work that we do. Can I you, you, you know, you mentioned that you're a fashion photographer that, and, and you do a lot of advertising and advertorial. And this is, these are things that you're known for, these glam, this glamorous, shoots yes. of whimsical wonder and you know yes. Im just imagining things yes, um yes. and i wanted to know and you, you also mentioned that you know after the first day of you know the shooting you 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 come you said you calm down i love that you use that word you said you calm yes, down yes, yes. And you just said okay let me know what is really going on what is really happening exactly what, what did that what did that process do for you and your practice well, the truth is this, you know, I've always, you know, when they say activism, um, what we do is to bring stuff to light. You know, um, when I started my career as a photographer, I would say my first journey into photography was through reportage, actually, you know, just itinerant photographer with the camera on the street and looking at things and observing closely there was something beautiful about that whole kind of uh, being a vagabond, you know, you just pick your camera, you don't know what you're going to shoot and you don't know what you're going to see. It's very adventurous, it was beautiful, um, you know? So my early days were like that, you know, I was taking those type of photographs, but at time, as time sort of went on, I started to redefine what my purpose was in the whole photography thing. I started to see that, well, there are other stories that also need to be told, you know, apart from the dark ones. Um, nothing wrong with exposing all the bad things happening to us in Africa. But I've also found out that, you know, our society is replete with hopelessness. Everybody you see, you ask them, so how are you going to move forward in life? You'll say, oh, God is going to help me. I'm going to be this superstar, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, right? If you ask him, what do you think about Nigeria? You say, no, Nigeria is, is finished. There's no hope. There's nothing we can do. We are dead in the water, you know? So you can see this contradiction of the individual struggling, struggling to make sense of his existence. But at the same time, he cannot find hope in nationhood and where he is because, well, to some extent, we are being bombarded, especially with news uh, of a lot of negative you know, material. And if you watch that long enough, you will start to despair. You know? So I decided to go on the path of creating fantasies and creating hope. So I take somebody and I say, you know what? What do you imagine yourself being? What do you imagine could happen in the future. And they say, oh, I see myself like this and like that. I say, let us create it. So we create this, this fantasy. And that is what all these editorials are. They are not real. They are not, there's no truth in them. They are all imagination of things that could be. Mm. You know, and sometimes they create an impression of a society um, that brings hope. It's controversial anyway. You know, a lot of times, too much of anything is also very bad. And so I went on that part. So on that, my first day, I was just being my regular Kelechi Amadiobi, you know, I've got nice strobes and I'm shooting all these people and 
I'm just doing I, what I, I normally do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just doing what I normally do. I'm creating fantasies. You know, somebody jumps up and I stop action and all that. It's beautiful. This is what I do. This is who I am. You know, on the second day, I had to pull that toga off and say, you know what? Let me observe deeply and try to understand what is going on here. And then I, that's when I started observing the different classes of people, how they were mixing, what they were saying. You know, people are chanting, Igbo, Aosa, Yoruba, we are one, you know? And I said, that is it. That is it. That is what the people in power are afraid of. When the people say we are one, you know? When the people start to determine how they should be ruled, when the people start to hold their leaders accountable, you know? So I started seeing, you know, coming to that rally every day, involve people getting educated, you know? Then I started documenting that, you know? Then I started looking at what, what, what did this person write on that placard? How does it relate to him as a human being? Can I extract his pain, you know, by looking at him and the, the placard? Can I uh, isolate somebody from the crowd that seems in a state of euphoria, you know, and try to define the spirit of what is happening? You know, extreme hope. You know, and this, so um, then I started observing that. And I'm doing all this because, well, I came there with no particular agenda. I really don't work for Reuters or CNN or any of these people because, well, that's not my route. So I'm just making this picture strictly for myself, you know, because I felt something deep. I said, these young people, you know, they, they are doing something great. And I, I, I cannot tell my children and my children's children that I was in Lagos and I did not document this. I don't know if you get what I mean. Yeah. So, and like she said, by the third day, I was holding uh, this, uh, what do you call it? Microphone. Megaphone. I mean, this megaphone uh, and I was shouting answers. My camera was now slung to my back and uh, you know, and that was it. I didn't even make any photographs again that day. You know, by the time we finished shouting and as we got to the place, it was dark. I was now taking pictures of people holding candles and things like that, you know. So um, it was an all round experience, you know, for me. And I was very happy to have lent my presence, you know, to it and my voice, you know, to it. Um, every publication has their own agenda in terms of what they want to do with your image. You know, sometimes they will put it, they will publish it in a way you did not imagine, especially if you don't have editorial control over the work, if you get what I mean, yeah. you know? So it now depends on how, how they put it up. Um, it may not work for what you want or what you had in your, in your head or the story we are trying to tell. So it's like that, you know? Uh, but for me, it was wonderful that we documented and all these young photographers were documenting what they were documenting. I know some organizations thought it important to collate some of this material. You know, you need to organize it and put it in one place and write about it and let it resonate. It is part of the echo of that energy. We shouldn't let the energy die. And when they were, you are talking about, oh, we don't have a leader kind of thing. Well, that's interesting, but eventually I do believe that you need to have people that represent you. You need to have uh, people that carry the struggle um, forward, you know? Otherwise, hmm, yeah, okay, you we'll, don't we'll, have control. We'll, we'll, come, we'll come back to that portion of the conversation. Yes. Um, uh, just um, to everyone who is in, in this, um, who is part of this conversation, please, you can send us questions as well, because after the conversations, I'll bring out your questions to our panelists and we'll just be like, you know, thrashing it out. So please do send your questions into the chat box and I'll be reading those as well. Um, just a reminder, I, it, Kalechi did mention, you know, the fact that, you know, these, these images were so powerful. A lot of these images are on the new Nigeria studios. So, um, which is a, a curated exhibition that's happening right now at artxlagos.com. So please do check it out after the conversation to see some incredible images from over 58 artists from around 17 states in the country. Um, yeah, guys, yeah. We, we, we both do, you know, do commissioned work for international organizations, um, news, news, national media. And something that was really, I mean, we, we can't deny the power of these images, the, the images that came out of this protest. And I think one of the, the reasons for that was 
we were we were we were speaking for ourselves you know um our people were taking out we're, we're photographing a movement organized by us there was there was nuance in the images there was there was power in the images but there was also intimacy in the images and then diversity as well um, I thought that was just incredibly powerful. And I want you to speak to, to the, because I feel like in a way it's a revolutionary moment where you are not, you know, because of COVID, we are not having white photographers coming into Nigeria, taking the pictures, you know? So we're doing this work for ourselves. Whether, and people were not commissioned to do it. They were just taking it before publications started reaching out to them to publish their photos. Well, our stories. Yeah, yeah. I, exactly. And I, I really want you to speak to the power of that moment where, because I feel like it was a re reclamation for us, for people, for us as storytellers as well. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm wondering your sort of your, your thoughts and your take on that. Well, I absolutely, you know, I was, I wasn't expecting to see the number of photographers on ground that I saw throughout the um, weeks, but I lo absolutely loved it. Absolutely loved it because I could imagine, <laughs> like you said, because of this COVID-19, it would have been a comp like, as far as the image is going out to the international publications, it would have been a completely different story because by then, COVID-19 aside, people would have been being flown in to cover the stories and all this other stuff, which speaks a lot to how little, you know, there have been changes when it comes to diversity and representation and everybody's fun wor words in their Western publications. But at the end of the day is it still would have happened. Um, so I think that at the end of the day is we saw the need to more than anything, like, you know, I love what Kilichi said as far as, you know, his kids now, grandkids later on asking him where he was, you know, and that was something that came <laughs> I actually have to go on the right side of history. <laughs> <laughs> but that was something me and my friends discussed when we were out there matching. It's like, yes, we can say where we were in yes. October of 2020. We can exactly. say exactly what we were doing and we were not sitting at home. Over my friends who were like, you know, saying, oh, well, we don't want to come out in the sun and all. They eventually came out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whether it was performative or not, those numbers still mattered. You know? Yeah. And, yes. And the closeness and intimacy in those images, you know, and the fact that now, thankfully, you know, these images can be shared on platforms and whatnot. I can only hope, I am a pessimist, unfortunately, but I can only hope that, you know, this pushes more of the necessity for us to tell our own stories. And not just for us to tell our own stories, but for multiple people to tell our stories, you know, it's not just me, it's not just Kelechi who was there, you know, there were, I would say hundreds, hundreds of, hundreds of, of out yes. there. No, I mean, the, and, the, it was beautiful, I mean, to look at the sheer number of photographers um, that were there, and they all had the urge to document, to, to, to let their voice be heard. And they were using their talent to move the, 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 the thing forward. And I keep saying, you know, this movement is an energy. It's energy. It's raw energy. It's a feeling. It's, um, I don't know how to put it, but it's a movement. Now, um, it is so difficult for a politician to come now and start talking the same rubbish that they normally talk. Because everybody is really, how do they say, is woke. You know, and so people, that energy needs to be directed in a certain place. You know, I, I was listening to somebody, I said, you know, the energy of um, Occupy Nigeria was used to kick out PDP and install APC. That's what happened. Because the people did not really decide what they wanted to do with that energy, somebody else will take that energy. And it may not bring whatever it is you wanted at the beginning of the day, you know? And I'm saying, you know, this energy is so pure and beautiful that we need to get deliberate about what next. Does it involve everybody getting a, their voters card? Does it involve everybody thinking deeply 
about the sort of leadership that we, we, we deserve and we ought to get. How do we take this energy and brew it and let it bring out something positive that can build a nation, you know, where Nigerians actually care for each other? Because for me, that is a major, major problem. Nigerians are not caring for each other. Nigerians are not bothered about each other. Nigerians are not seeing their fellow citizens as citizens. You know? They just know that these are my friends. These are my relations. This is member of my tribe, you know? But when something happens a little far from where you are, nobody is reacting. You know, like right now, I'm really a bit, I don't understand why we haven't shut down Lagos because of these guys that got killed in the north. I don't understand why people are not on the streets with placards. You wake up one morning, 70 something people get killed and we're all carrying on with our business. For me, that is strange. So there are deep, yeah. yeah, there are deep set, deep set. I don't think it is normal. When they kidnapped the Chibok girls too, I thought there was something wrong with Nigeria. You know, we needed to wait for people for Michelle Obama to say, bring back our girls for that to happen. So if you look at the social media now, the sort of energy that people put into some of these issues. And it's, it's also a good thing to sort of compare, right? The, the Lekki toll gate and whatever that happened, there are a lot of educated people, well-informed, carrying the camera and documenting global level, you know, um, and nobody can forget it. The evidence is there. there. Some people in power are trying to change the narrative. They're looking so stupid because there's overwhelming evidence being recorded. And that's the power of imagery. Yeah. I don't know if you get what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. Now, but those farmers, we still did not, nobody, does it mean nobody had a phone when that thing was happening? It is very possible. I remember I went to Chibok to go and see the parents of those girls. That place was looking crazy. Nobody will absolutely have a phone, not to talk of a phone that has a camera. Um, I'm, I want to, so I'm going to pause now because um, I want, we will come back to this and to the idea of how, how are we moving forward after, you know, beyond this movement and even as storytellers, as photographers, as artists, what are we, how can we be a part of sustaining a movement, right? Um, but before that, I want us to go into, because there are lots of um, questions and comments in the chat. So I just want us to go through that very quickly. Um, someone here says, why is it that it takes this level of tragedy and internal international gaze for Nigerian institutions to create infrastructure for artists on ground? Um, that's a very interesting comment because I think I also remember people were raising money for um, photographers to get protective gear during, during after just after the protest. Um, someone says there's a running thread. Hold on a second. Okay, um, there's a running thread from yesterday's talk. Sir, the revolution has begun. Um, began begun to this talk. We need to tell our own stories. No one else is going to do it for us. And that's from Iberia. Thank you very much. And um, Tokini says, there were thousands of photographers. We received over a thousand applications from photographers within the first two days when we announced our artist at X Lagos support initiative. That's incredible. Um, somebody else here says, the world is changing radically. Many societies are waking up in Europe. Such a shock is the, um, is the coronavi um, coronavirus pa um, pandemic. Europeans need to rethink their lives. The situation is different in Nigeria. Nigerian society wants to be a partner in its country, not a tool. I hope that the protests in October are the beginning of these good changes. Photography is a special artistic medium um, that captures these important moments. Um, Charlotte here says, I keep wondering what if the protests were managed better without total obstruction to traffic? There were instances people had to get to hospital urgently, but couldn't move. I think they would have con um, continued for up to a month. Um, Obiaska says, um, great conversation. Um, we also have somebody says, I felt real hope for Nigeria's future during the NSARS protest. I still carry this hope with me. Um, and um, Barry also says that, um, so, so true. And I think she's referring to Kalechi's comment, says they want to keep us divided. Um, typical divide and conquer strategy. Um, thank you very much for your messages. Um, I think I have to go to the inbox for some questions, but um, before I address the questions in the inbox, very quickly, um, 
So, Yagazie, moving forward, you know, we had this moment, it culminated in something very extremely quite tragic um, at the end. I remember you taking photo, um, showing us photographs of the day after with, you know, after what I, I personally feel was carnage as well. Um, and I think something that Kelechi did point out is how there's a stop and go thing that we do as Nigerians. So we do, you know, you mentioned Chiba girls, we make the noise, we move on. You know, it's almost as though memory is very short for us uh, and we get on with it. And I also think sometimes it's also part of survival. You know, we have to, we have to live and we have to survive. You can't, you can't function on, on fighting 24 hours a day. Just being a Nigerian is a fight in itself. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a, it, we're just being alive as a Nigerian is an act of resilience in itself. Um, so, you know, and I think that was why this protest really did something for us because we couldn't believe that we could get to this point where we we're like, you know, we are going to leave our own individual fight and come and fight collectively uh, at the end of the day. But um, I think the point that you did raise is interesting and important. How, how do we sustain this movement? And, I, and I, I'm interested in our roles as artists as documentarians as photographers what for you Yagazi what's your what's your take um I believe that our role more than anything is to always be ready to be present you know like I said earlier is we're not we're not the main ones on the front lines unless we are ready for that and I'll be frank with you I'm not ready for that personally speaking I, I'm not going to sugarcoat it to say that I'm ready to be marching every single day and we appreciate, we appreciate your honesty yeah i'm going i'm going to the panel um the judiciary panels as a way to follow up and i'll tell you my leg and body will give up on me and my mind will be lost you know but what i am ready to do personally is still be present might not be every day but for the most part so even though you know the protests have you know died down in some parts and whatnot i'm still working on stories around it you know, even if, you know, if a protest arises tomorrow, I would hope. And the main thing is, once again, it's hard for me to detach myself and say, like, the photographer's, photographer's self is separate. Because if we started organizing again, the way in October with the protest being in X, Y, and Z locations, I will be there. Not because I am a photographer, but because I care. And that is the same energy that I truly believe that the majority of people who are attending the protests are ready to do again. You know, it Lekki massacre was traumatizing to a lot of people, more so the people who are actually present, you know, because at the height of, you know, the protests in the United States, you know, at the beginning of the year, I would make a joke saying, people would say, oh, well, Nigeria should do their own. And people would make jokes saying, ah, they'll just kill us, finish. You know, or we'll go out and they'll shoot us. This was a joke, you know, but then we went out. And for a while, even though things were happening in pockets here and there, nothing was happening until what we believed that the government was capable of doing, but yet somehow they didn't believe they would actually do, yeah. happened, you know, and... And that is scary for people, but I truly believe that it's not a thing of, you know, now that Lekki Massacre has occurred, everybody's just going to sit back down. I truly believe that people are ready to move again. You know, um, I saw someone's, um, co the comments you read out about the traffic happening. And if there was a way, first of all, with our infrastructure of roads, for us to allow, you know, essential workers, especially those in the medical field to move around and get to their workspaces and medical care be a priority. I truly believe that would have happened at the protests. You know, I, I don't believe that the protesters were intentionally blocking roads just so that nobody would get to the hospitals and whatnot. And it was a chance that we could say where it was like, sorry for the inconvenience, we're trying to change Nigeria. And it was also strategic exactly. in some places. You know, when we went to Alausa, we would go, we would march down to certain junctions and block the road, the intersection for about 10 minutes and then move on, but you will feel it. And I think that people are ready for that again. You know, even though we're not out in the masses like before, yeah. I think our job is to be on the ready and be ready to support because there will be people who will be doing, carrying a heavier load than us photographers. 
and we should be ready to make sure that they are seen, that they are heard even more, and they are not forgotten. That is our job. So I would say moving forward, just yeah, stay on the ready. <laughs> um, Kilechi, you know, oh, wow. you, you, you are, you've, I mean, I know that you are also, you are passionate about gov governance and politics on it, but let's, let's focus on as a storyteller and as a photographer. And the fact that, you know, you saw so many young people telling their stories by themselves, you know, through photography. Um, what, you know, how can, how, what, how can we sustain this movement? How can we sustain this energy? What I think the first thing um, for me that it's like extremely important is education. Um, you as a storyteller need to understand the story. They say the artist is a mirror of his environment, but then if the mirror is not clean, it cannot reflect anything. So you need to absorb first before you can reflect. And I believe that photographers, yeah, you know, we know how to handle the camera and things, but we need to educate ourselves. Because every photograph you take is an opinion. Question is it, is it an informed opinion? So I believe that uh, we as image makers and storytellers need to educate ourselves. We need to study history. We need to study what is happening in our society because uh, eventually you become a leader of opinion. It is what you record that then becomes history. And I say, we need to take that responsibility seriously and just stop pointing our cameras and just having fun, you know? And, settle down and look at the situation and ask what is what am i trying to say you know about this image especially in relation to what is going on in relation to the activism in relation to putting nigeria in a good place you know um i always say you know photographers are the priests at the altar of first impressions it is the pictures we put out there that the world will see and um it is because of these thousands of photographers that were shooting all around the country that brought this thing to bear, you know? Apart from the phone pictures, the real photographers who were taking their time to capture strong images, it resonated all through the country. And um, it brought people's attention, you know, to the issues. So what am I saying? To move forward, we need to get back deeper into ourselves to understand the essence of where we are going and be targeted. So if we say, oh, we are, like, we are looking to foster unity, we are looking not to um, allow the usual thing that happens in the past, where they will say, oh, is, is Hausa people or is this Igbo people or is this Yoruba people, they are at it again. And everybody scatters and the looters will keep looting. You know, is it to attack those differences? Maybe as a photographer, maybe what you should be doing is trying to educate other Nigerians about other Nigerians through your imagery. Like I used to say, you know, um, if all your career is in Lagos, please try and travel, go up north and go take some photos, educate people around you. If you're up north, try and go down to the east, educate people. This will foster understanding. You understand? You know, it's to look deeper into what are the problems that we have as photographers. I believe that Photography in itself is only a tool. The question is what is in the mind of the person welding the camera and what is he trying to say? And I'm saying our photographers need to assume that position of people who make a comment. You know, for instance, um, a writer could just write an illustration you know, to illustrate what happened, but he can also write a story that goes to define a relationship and nationhood. Somebody like Chino Achebe and his things fall apart. Just reading that book alone makes you to understand the real history, you know, of, of colonialism, you know, and how it affects new people. And based on that, you start to also understand how your life is being affected. And so it's beyond him writing, it is also him investigating to understand what he wants to talk about. So I'm saying, you know, we as photographers, we need to think deeper, understand what is happening, and then target our imagery you know, to that understanding and to see how we can contribute meaningfully, you know, to, to, to the movement, you know? But most of all, we should not let this energy go down. The energy has to stay alive. Yeah. I mean, just to really add on there, because like Kelechi has said two things that I 
I feel as if like you took it out of my head, but now because Kelechi, because you're my senior, I feel as if did I somehow hear Kelechi say this years ago and now because the first one when is when it comes <laughs> is when it comes to side notes, when it comes to our um, creating our own work. And now that I'm moving more into the art, like art practice, I always tell people I want to take the things that exist in my head and make them real. And Kelechi said that a little bit earlier before. And when it comes to photography, I think that's something, especially in this, in this movement of hopefully continuous change, be it also in our heads that photographers need to remember. And I always say this is that photography has been used as a weapon. Photography is a tool and people need to be aware of the fact that it is a tool and how you use it can either be used for good and bad or bad. You know, so if you do not know how to use your tool properly, and it's not just about the technical part of it of like, oh, I understand like lighting perfectly. But if you do not know how to use your tools, the actual ethics of photography, whether you have the right intentions, it can do a lot of damage if you're not properly informed and educated. And this is something that I definitely urge photographers to do, even if it's just a simple thing as Googling ethics of photography you know, which sometimes is also messed up depending on who writes it, but it's doing your research, talking to other photographers, yeah. reaching out, you know, and I think, you know, this is something that I think it's important in Nigeria that we, that oneness within our community as well, where it's like, if you have a question, just ask it, you know, reach out, start community building, talk to your peers, reach out to strangers, you know, if yeah. someone, if it's someone that you respect, ask these questions because this is the way that we will learn and stay yeah. informed. Yeah. People need to understand every act is propaganda. Every act is propaganda. Everything you create expresses an opinion. The question then is whose propaganda are you propagating? You know, you can do it unconsciously not knowing that you've subconsciously been affected and you've been recruited into a propaganda system that you do not know about because you have not thought deeply about it, right? You know, you personally, images, you, know, um, you, you must ask yourself that question, you know? Because the, I know, sorry, Kelechi, I know like there's sometimes where we see, when we look at the standard, um, standard of photography, you know, it's usually not the Nigerian standard. It's not the African standard. So who do we look to? The international exactly. standard, you know. That so for it. me, it's like, who is consuming our work that we create? You know, that are you it. taking images in a certain way because you know that X, Y, and Z publication that's the type of image that they like? Then so what? who are you creating these images for? You know, I think these are questions that people should it's always a, it's have. A interesting question. There, there's so much we can. We're we're running out of time. I okay, wish, okay, okay. I wish we have four questions that people have asked that we, do, we have to answer very quickly. I really want to talk about this so much because I think you guys make so much like, you know, poignant points on education in not just the technicality, but as storytellers. Um, education of the individual to be able to apply nuance to their, to their storytelling complicates the characters um, that they're covering. Um, and, and basically, you know, we, we all have a point of view, as I always say, but is your point of view informed? Is it layered? Is it complicated? Exactly. You know, all of those sorts of things. Okay, so we're going to go to quest the question very quickly. We have um, Barbara Barungi here says, Im impressive narrative through photography, but do both panelists at times feel they are talking and um, taking an individual risk, giving the heated quality um, particularly in case of NSARS. In many African countries, photography slash journalism, documentation of upheavals results in backlash by the authority. Does anybody want to address that but very quickly? Um, I think Kelechi can expand more on it, but for me personally, I think that Nigeria is yet to fully recognize the power of photography. Mm. to be able to now say, I'm going to tag, we're going to target that, but I'm sorry, Wana, they're going to target the journalists first. That has been the yes. issue, <laughs> you know? So unfortunately, you know, in other countries, like, you know, there are places that are more tightly clamped, such as Kenya or Tanzania and whatnot, or even Rwanda. So I think that there is, a, they understand the role that visual, like photographs can play. I don't think that here we are fully understanding. <laughs> 
that's good or <laughs> I think that's that's a good way to say it. I mean, you have you have a point there, but at some time they will wise up and realize the kind of power that we wield, and uh, and then it won't be so safe, you know, to express yourself. Um, it is risky, really. I mean, um, but I, I've also found out that it is risky to be alive because the consequence of being alive is death. And, but the worst thing is not being alive at all. Being afraid to express yourself is the ultimate death, you know? And um, I'm saying that, yeah, you know, it is risky, you know, to be alive. Uh, you can't tip it through life only to end up in death. You know, these are crazy times. And um, the people that we are dealing with, the government, some of the people that are, you know, um, like she said, you know, rightly so, they haven't quite acquired that level of sophistication, you know, to say, oh, wow, you know, who made that image? Let's arrest him and make sure he doesn't take that kind of picture. They're not quite educating us quite yet. <laughs> 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 uh, we have a question here. Um, in the course of the protest, this is from Anonymous. In the course of the protest, many women were on the front line championing and amplifying our collective voice. What can we learn from the role of women in society based on this? We have always been here. We've always been doing work. <laughs> we have always been on the front lines. I think there's just been a constant erasure and platform season, which I did witness at the protest as well. Um, so I think that's it. I think it's, I don't know how, how to, to word the necessity and, and power of the presence of women because we have always been yeah. present throughout all of this, throughout momentous um, happenings in history. Yeah, um, to the main question is, why isn't it, you know, emphasized enough? outside of women acknowledging ourselves. Yes. Well, the truth is that even at the end SARS thing, I, I noticed that very, very, very prominent role in terms of leadership that the women were playing, you know? But I don't know, Nigerian women are not um, timid at all. There's the boldness about the Nigerian woman. Um, I don't know if it is the same with the rest of Africa, but our women have always been able to speak out and stand for themselves. I mean, one of the most scary riots that the colonial masters experienced was the Abba women's riots. You know, these women defied, you know, their gunboat diplomacy and they, they couldn't understand it. Why are these women not afraid of us? You know, they had subdued the men, if you get what I mean, you know? So um, it's important you know, and it cannot be overemphasized, you know, um, the role that women are playing. Like she said, you know, they've always been there. And okay. all we need to do is to come together and um, keep pushing. Any society that recognizes these women and their effort has double, you know, the advantage that they have. All those societies I mean, that are suppressing their women are losing half uh, of their population. Yeah, but also to add like you know it's I, I do think it's worth noting that yes there was togetherness at the protests one Nigeria one people everybody was checking in on people but there was also <laughs> uh, what's the word like women were still being assaulted yeah. you know um, queer queer communities were still being targeted which is very frustrating which adds into you know my like my pessimism of we're all here fighting. And you know, this is this can also be reflected with the BLM protests in the States, where you know women were in the front line fighting for the lives of black men and they were being killed by black men, you know, <laughs> in the same in the same timeline. Mm -hmm. So this is where like we, we can acknowledge and praise women and and also the women from queer communities who are fighting for us, but we need to protect them as well. So maybe this is why people can say like, oh, you know, what more can we do to, um, to show that women are part of this? I think you can start with protecting women more. Right? Well, just start off with protecting women. Protecting, amplifying, and not trying to hijack platforms or erase And them. that. Um, very quickly, very, very quickly, your closing remarks. Um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> hey, 
can we move? <laughs> <laughs> We move. I love it. It is because yeah. I'm ready. I'm ready. I've rested it. No, I'm ready. We move. <laughs> Not to lose sight, you know, of that hope. Yeah. No society can really move forward without hope. And Nigeria had, we had journeyed into this abyss of pessimism and hopelessness for too long. You know, the young people must hold on to this hope that they are not powerless, that their voice will be heard and that they would demand for good leadership. They should not say, what can we do? They are stronger than us. They are weak. We are strong. Wow. Um, thank you also. Thank you, Kelechi Amadi Obi. If we were, if we were in our, if our usual communing now, would have had a thunderous applause, but you know, I was really clear. <laughs> um, big, big thank you to Yagazi Emezi. <laughs> um, for sharing your insights, for sharing your experience, for, for being honest and being vulnerable with us as well, and, and just willing to answer everything. We really appreciate it. Um, big shout out, of course, to Artex and the team for putting this conversation together. Um, it was very poignant and very important because of what's, what's happening right now, and to be able to, art is about reflecting the spirit of the times, and I think it was so important for us to be able to have this conversation because October was not, was not so, so far away. Um, I think, you know, you guys have said everything. We move, we need to keep, sustain the momentum, sustain the energy. Um, to the photographers out there, please, um, you know, educate yourself, be ready, be prepared, and let's, let's get on with doing this work as well. Um, also, don't forget to log on to um, artxlagos.com um, to check out the new Nigeria Studios exhibition that's going on right now. They're incredible, powerful images. And as I said, something that's really, just really stayed with me was the fact that we were getting to tell our stories ourselves. It's something we, as a storyteller, it's something I fight for every single day. You know, having your stories told by other people, other people controlling your narrative and that being global, it, it can be a very painful thing to watch on a daily basis. So we get to re regain our power. Um, and we get to, you know, that there is that phrase, um, phrase that says, there's nothing like the voiceless, just the deliberately silent. And I think we got to unsilence ourselves this time around. And I hope yeah. that's going to continue. Exactly. So thank you to everyone who tuned in, who stayed with us. Thank and, you, Juana. Thank you for being so awesome as always. We appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs> thank we you so much to all of you for that wonderful conversation. It was riveting, it was candid, and it was extremely poignant. Um, as you rightly said, uh, Juana, I hope many artists who have tuned in have gotten a lot from it and those who will listen to the recording in the future will also learn quite a bit. So thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your day. And to those of you in the audience listening, thank you so much for joining us and we hope to see you at future talks. Thank you. Peace and love everyone.